Hi, everyone. Welcome to Every Day, your daily stop for virtual reality content. I am back. I was briefly away for a day or so because I was wrapping up my final project, but I am all done with school for the semester. So I am super excited about that. And I'm just going to be doing some research over the summer. I'm going to make videos for you guys. Everything's going to be great. So um, I'm also excited today because I am inaugurating my brand new SSD RAID. I got myself two solid state disks. They are super fast. I put them in a striped RAID 0 volume together, and I'm going to use them to record raw video so that I can get super, super fast video at 60 frames a second without sacrificing my frame rate. And this will enable me to get high frame rates and a lot more demos than I could before. So this is going to be great for recording uh, video at high frame rates for and on games where I was struggling to get 30 FPS and have a nice experience in the Rift. I'm going to have a much nicer experience now and I'll be able to give you those better impressions. So this is really exciting. Um, now getting on to today's demo. Today I'm going to be looking at a little demo that not many people are familiar with. It's been around for a while. It's called Inside Vermeer Studio. Vermeer is a, uh, a Dutch painter, and he was, uh, he was a famous genre painter. He um, did a bunch of paintings of just middle-class people indoors doing various things. And um, Vermeer, he was kind of interesting in a lot of ways. He was a very uh, sparse painter. He painted like 32 or 35 pictures that we can identify to him in his whole lifetime. And, um, and most of, a lot of them were just painted inside his house at home. So um, we're actually going to be going inside his studio at home. We're going to see a lot of the places in that room where his paintings were painted. And it's going to tell us a little bit about Vermeer. So this is a great example of an educational application, and it's it should just be a cool experience. So let's go ahead and jump in and check it out. Keep in mind, this episode is available at 60 frames a second. If you want to watch it, just click the link in the description. You, if you're watching this on YouTube, it is, of course, 30 frames a second because that's YouTube's limitation. Let's go. All right, here we are in Vermeer's studio. This is a cozy looking little room. Reminds me somewhat of other cozy little locations like the room in Blocked In. Oh, what's this, what's this thing next to my face? Is that some kind of curtain? I see. Let's just hang in there. It's not really wafting in the breeze or anything, so it looks kind of static. But I do have all these little dust particles there floating around. Those are cool. This is a dusty little room. Let's see what's going on here. So you can walk around very slowly in this demo. There's no need to rush around when there's only a small room to explore. Whoa! Is that him? Is that him in the mirror? Also, this mirror is really low resolution for some reason. That's kind of funny. Yeah, it looks like he's over there. He's over there painting in the mirror. Whoa! Vermeer! What's up? Whoa. Vermeer? Vermeer? Where'd you go? Come back. Come back. Whoa, he's all two-dimensional and only exists on one side. Trippy. Huh. Okay. Well, I guess this is where he sits to do his painting. Oh, look, there's another person in the corner. And if you've seen Vermeer's artwork, you'll recognize some of these people right away. These are actually, like, cutouts from his paintings, I believe. Positioned in the room, in the place where he would have painted them. All right. That's weird how they only show up on one side. We're looking at Jan Vermeer's The Art of Painting, which is a painting of a painter painting a painting. <laughs> it is indeed. And he's painting a model who he's going to transform into the muse of history. So she is Clea. We can identify her by what she holds, the trumpet in the book, and also the laurel leaves on her head. So she's an allegorical figure. We might think about the Statue of Liberty, for example. So that idea of painting's power to transform is actually central to this image. Doesn't it feel as though we have a privileged view into this studio? Look at the curtain that's been drawn 
back that takes up the top quarter of the painting. We're looking at a scene that we don't normally get to see. If you look at that curtain that's been drawn back, there's a kind of interesting optical quality. It's a little bit out of focus. It shimmers and shines, but the points of light are a little too big. It's as if the entire painting doesn't resolve until you get to what the artist himself is looking at, that is his model. That's where we start to see a clarified focus. And it's almost as if the painting has a depth of field, so much so that some art historians have suggested that perhaps he was using a camera obscura, that is a kind of simple early camera without film, to begin to process the transformation of the three-dimensional onto the two-dimensional plane. And the subject always with Vermeer is light. We don't see the source of the light, which is behind that curtain, but the light filters onto the chandelier above, onto the muse of history, onto the objects on the table, across the floor, on the artist's stockinged feet, on the tiles, catching the brass tacks on that upholstered chair on the right. I mean, we can follow its pathway. I especially love the way the light catches the ridging on the map itself and creates those highlights and shadows. And look at the artist. He's dressed up too. He's dressed up the model, but he's wearing something fancier than the artist would traditionally wear in the studio. This black vest that has these openings and slits in it and this really nice hat. And the he's, bright orange leggings. This is an image that was obviously important to Vermeer. It's larger than most of his work. The artist in it is dressed up. It was still in his possession at the time of his death. His wife actually tried to save it from his creditors who were after his estate, which was heavily in debt. So this is an important painting. It reminds me actually of of the painting Las Meninas by Velázquez, yeah. uh, where the artist uh -huh. paints a self-portrait. In that case, we can see his face, but he's dressed in a very formal manner, in a way that is meant to place the artist within society at a very high level. Exactly. And dignify the profession. Vermeer paints in such a careful and defined way that we might actually look in past the frame of the canvas and think to ourselves that we're actually looking into this room. But the fact that Vermeer has depicted an artist painting reminds us that this is simply a construction, that this is an artificial image. That's really cool. So that's actually excerpted from a, a course on a course on art from Khan Academy. And they just played it right up here on the wall. And this is really cool how you can watch the video, look at the um, look at the video of the sh you can look at the painting, you can hear them talk about the painting and zoom in parts of the painting. And then they're like, and the curtain. I'm like, what, Th you mean that curtain? That curtain right over there? Yeah, yeah, I see it. And this is, there's just this really cool interplay between the instructional material and the environment that it actually recreates the environment that the painting occurred in. And here's the map, you can get a closer look at it. There's nothing subtle about 17th century Dutch genre painting. So often we're shown interactions that are wonderfully bawdy and wonderfully explicit. There is an exception, however. Jan Vermeer's paintings often are riddles. They give us suggestions of narratives. And in this painting, it's true. We're not really sure exactly what's about to unfold. What we're seeing is a man who is still wearing his hat and outer cloak. He stands beside a table with a beautiful carpet on it, and he has his hand on a jug of wine. He looks like he's ready to refill the young woman's glass. She's got it up to her mouth, and she's just finishing it off. Well, and he looks impatient to pour her another their glass as though the goal of this whole interaction is to get her drunk. But across from her, at the window that is ajar, we can actually see a rendering in the stained glass of temperance, of moderation, in a sense an instruction to her to watch her step. And so the painting is about possibility. It's about her choice. And the man whose face is shadowed by his hat is a little bit sinister in that way. There's a sense of distance between the two figures, a sense that they're not terribly familiar with one another. And I almost wonder whether the wine is going to make that happen. One of the reasons that the flirtation doesn't have an opportunity to be represented is because he's in shadow. We can just barely make out his eyes. And her eyes are completely obscured by the shine in the beautifully delicate glass that she holds in front of her face. She can't speak now. She's drinking. And she can't even see beyond that glass, or at least we can't see. 
And yet, that shine is all about vision, and it's held right at her eyes. This is an early Vermeer, but already we can see his fascination with soft light. And look at the way it infuses this space, comes through that blue curtain, and the delicacy that he's lavished on the tonality of the back wall and the other forms in this room. It's just spectacular. So while Vermeer is interested in light, we also have that characteristic geometry in the composition, the square of of the window that's open, the rectangle of the frame on the back wall. Looks like when I walk away from it. The square on the back of the chair and the squares that move back. Yeah, when I walk far enough away from it, it actually stops the video, but it starts playing it again when I approach it again. So I can just watch those videos anytime I feel like it. I can resume them. I can go check out the things they were talking about. And, and, and they've got this, this mirror here. I wonder if they're trying to emulate like an old mirror, how they used to be warped, or if that's just, just an artifact. It's hard for me to tell. There's this big door here. Look how wide this door is. This door looks like it's like six feet wide. There's the painter. Where's, where did your subject go? How do I make them appear and disappear? I haven't figured that out yet. I have not figured that out yet. There's this jug here. Is this the actual jug that the uh, that the guy was holding and trying to get her drunk in that painting? It is possible. And there's some bread there. Or the jug might be from the other painting. Uh, it might be the same jug. Maybe he's just using the same jug in all his paintings. He's like, here, hold this jug. I will paint you. Oh, I can see outside. Oh, that's what those sounds I'm hearing are. They're like the people outside doing doing town things. Like the horse is going by. I, I actually really like the background sound in this. It's it's you know it's subtle, but it creates the sense that like you're in a room that's part of a larger world, even if you're not able to really see that larger world very much, except the glimpse of it through the window. Is that is that another one of his paintings down there? The person in the doorway. It's hard for me to tell. I don't know if that's actually one of his paintings. But yeah, I love this, how they've really, like, they haven't recreated all of his paintings. They kind of focused on, especially on that one. Um, but they did a great re job of recreating this one and and of positioning the people in it. To, yep, there's the the lady in blue again. Is, is that the lady with the pearl earring? I think that's one of his masterpieces, unless I'm mix mixing it up with the other one. But yeah, that's really cool. And, and how they reproduced, like, all the things in the painting, like this curtain and have the artist himself here and they they kind of fade in the view so you can see like what the what the studio would look like if he was not here as well as kind of the position that he took in it when he was painting and there's just there's there's so much to learn in this application so much to explore in this room and it gives you and and it gives you like just looking at the paintings like you can kind of imagine like oh yeah I guess the studio looked like that but it's, it's different when you're standing in it and you're totally surrounded by it and you can see it from different perspectives. And it, it, really, it really puts it in a new light. And this is, I really like this application, even though like, it's, it's something you only do once and, and you explore it and then you've seen it. But like, imagine if instead of just watching those two videos on Khan Academy, you, everybody watched them in this room and they could really explore the room. And, and take all these perspectives on the paintings. It would really, really could redefine how we do art history. Perspective on the floor. There is this kind of checkboard pattern that does create a clear, structured interior. And then we have objects that are placed as... So, yeah, I'm going to actually go ahead and finish here. I think I've said all I want to say about this demo, but this is, this is really cool. I really like it. And I hope to see a lot more educational uh, demos that immerse you in... Um, immerse you in their subject and immerse you in the world of their subject in a way that's um, that in a way that feels really authentic and compelling like this one does and in a way that relates kind of their work and the media and the events to to the things in the environment anyway that's all for today and uh, let me know what you guys think of the video and of the 60 FPS version let me get uh, let me know what other demos you want to see me play and uh, I will see you next time everybody have a great Every day.